here till 4.30, but. You're like always class from 1.45 until 4.45. <laughs> when the, the sustainability speaker series is, we all like come here together. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm excited to introduce Cassie Cordova, Sustainability Division Manager for the City of Clearwater. Thank you for coming. Okay. I'll just stand here. From um, the last conference last week and um, from work as well. So my name is Cassie Cordova. I am currently the sustainability manager for the city of Clearwater. Um, I just started in this role about three and a half months ago. You also do that work in here. So I'm going to walk you today through my sustainability journey um, that started here at the College of Global Sustainability. So this is just all of the projects and events that I'm going to cover. Um, you can go ahead and next As I said, um, I was a student here. I started in the fall of 2017 and graduated in December of 2019. So at the time, um, I did a double concentration in sustainable tourism and climate change adaptation and mitigation. I also completed the certificate in food sustainability and security. Um, and I was an active member in GLOBE, which I'm sure you all know. Um, so as I was a student here, um, I thought that it was really important that I attend my classes in person, even though I live all the way over in Palm Harbor. So it took me like two hours to drive here in traffic. Um, but the reason I did that was because for my undergraduate, I went to the University of Florida and I had like 100 people in every class and I didn't really get to know my professors uh, very well. Um, so when I came to grad school, I knew that it was really important to make connections. Um, so I came to class, I got to know all my professors, and um, one of the projects that came up was Dr. Brooke Hansen suggested um, for students to come out to this Turn the Tide <coughs> Turpin meeting. Um, so Turpin Springs is very close to where I live, so I was like, yay, finally something over in Pinellas County. So I jumped in on that, and it had just formed. Um, it was a group of citizens that were interested in having the city address sea level rise. Um, they had been meeting for a while, but they hadn't really organized. So I hopped in and I said, let's do this. Let's make this a 501c3. My mom's a CPA, so she was able to do that for us. Um, and we established three goals for Turn the Tide for Tarpon. So we wanted the, um, the city council to establish formal sustainability goals, hire a sustainability coordinator, write a sustainability action plan, and form a citizen advisory board to do that. If you have a look at the city of Tarpon Springs website today, you will see that they currently have a sustainability coordinator. They've written a sustainability action plan and they have a sustainability advisory committee. So we accomplished all of our goals um, and I'm actually currently working with the sustainability coordinator on a grant. So that's really full circle kind of how that came about. And, and this happened throughout my, um, since I've come back to Florida, I've had several encounters with people that I worked with either at Patel or through a project at Patel that have now come back around for a project that I'm working on. So really, I can't stress enough how important it is to make those connections. So one of the connections I have here, um, Dory Larson, she was the founder. She was the one that kind of organized Turn the Tide for Tarpon, and she'll come up later today. Next slide. Another project that was offered, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is going out to Fat Beat Farm. Again, Oldsmar, pretty close by to me. Um, so we went out there, and um, as you can see in the bottom right, I helped actually build the biodigester that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And I remember, you know, when we started talking about it, everyone was so excited about it. And then when it came to the day of actually building it, I think there was us and a couple of <laughs> you know, Fat Beat Farm employees, and that was about it. And I specifically remember saying something to TH, like, where is everybody? And he said, well, you know, people like to talk a lot about sustainability, but when it comes to doing it, they don't show up. 
So I would encourage you to show up. Um, I ended up getting an internship there and I um, I painted the biodigester. I helped install the um, solar water system on the roof. Um, I helped dig some of the fields, worked in the electronic room, the microgreens. Um, it was a really great experience. I wrote a blog on it that um, I personally really enjoy. So um, you, I can share a link to that as well. Next slide. So um, the next internship I did, so this was for my capstone experience. Um, so I knew for me, Actually, we were about to publish it tomorrow, but since you reached out, you can be our intern. So um, I went up to DC for my last semester at Patel, and um, it was a great experience. I love DC. Um, unfortunately, COVID happened, so you know I had to come back. Um, but I really enjoyed my time there, and um, it was a great experience for me as like my first kind of professional setting. Good. And then another project I worked on also with Dr. Hansen. Uh, I found a job and um, I went to James City County, Virginia. If you're not familiar with that, I say that's where the other Bush Gardens is. Um, so, you know, this Bush Gardens 
Tampa Bay, Busch Gardens, Williamsburg. So Williamsburg's in James Lee County. Um, so the population is about 80,000 there. I was the sustainability coordinator. Um, this was not a new position. They'd actually had this position for well over 10 years, which is pretty um, progressive, especially considering it's not particularly a progressive area. I mean, it's about half and half, um, but like several of the surrounding localities did not have this position. Um, I was also the energy manager for the county, which meant I used energy cap to analyze all of the county's energy bills, natural gas, electricity. Um, and I worked with the facilities. I led the facilities energy team. So worked with the HVAC, um, the electrical, all the guys on how we could reduce our energy consumption throughout the county. Um, that was also something I didn't really have a background in. So I was able to take um, a certified energy manager course which was really important, um, which you can't technically become a certified energy manager until you have a certain many years experience, but I'm technically one in training. Um, and then I was also staff liaison to the Clean County Commission. So as you may or may not know, a lot of local municipalities have um, like a, an organization full of volunteers that um, they do certain things for their city or county. So ours was called the Clean County Commission. Um, throughout every every locality usually has something that's in charge of their litter cleanups and their beautification, things like that. Um, so our Clean County Commission was also um, part of our Keep James City County Beautiful, which is the local Keep America Beautiful affiliate. So I was the executive director of that. Um, so there's quite a bit that entails uh, doing, you know, all the paperwork and, and things that you have to do on an annual basis to be a Keep America Beautiful affiliate. We had to do an annual litter index where we drove around the county to identify litter. Um, we had to do a governance report and all that. So we focused on litter recycling and beautification. So as you may notice, this was quite the diverse role. Um, it was actually like in retrospect, now that I'm at the city of Clearwater, um, there's about 20 people that do what I did for one county and the population difference isn't that great. So I did a lot um, and it was it was awesome. I loved my experience in Virginia, but towards the end, I was really getting to the point where, you know, I kept trying to explain that I couldn't do all these things and that I shouldn't be doing all these things. Like I shouldn't be the energy manager. That should be its own role. Like I kept trying to explain that we should have a division manager and then it should be broke out to like an outreach coordinator and energy manager. Um, so really it should have been at least three people's roles. Um, but I'm grateful for it because I learned a lot of different things that I probably wouldn't have learned had I been in a more specific role. And I also learned about local government. And the thing about local government is you're going to get pulled into a lot of different things. Um, one of the things I don't have on here listed is that we did a solid waste consolidation study. So the county did not offer trash collection that was contracted out. Uh, <coughs> contract with one of seven different local um, contractors to have their trash picked up. But the county, as it's growing in population, was debating on whether or not they wanted to provide trash as a service. And somehow I became the, the project manager on that project, which doesn't really relate to sustainability. I mean, of course, it would have had sustainable benefits because there would have been far fewer emissions from all the different trucks on the road. But certain things like that, they come back later, like somehow it all fits in. Now I know literally today my manager, uh, my director was talking about how we are looking at optimizing our fleet route for our solid waste, solid waste um, company, or, or we do it internally. And he's talking about that we're potentially partnering with Routeware. Well, I know all about Routeware. Even though I shouldn't know about Routeware, I do because that's what I did in that role. So um, I really like working for local government. I think every day is something different. And I also think that you have a, a larger impact, even though things may take a really long time to get done. <laughs> Once you get them done, it's pretty impressive and you can impact the whole community. Um, and by the way, the stars on the things are the things that I started myself. Um, so when I first started, I started in February. Um, and as you know, April is the big month for Arbor Day and Earth Day. And I said, what are we doing for Arbor Day and Earth Day? And I reached out to, you know, the within the county um, and other local municipalities and nobody had anything going. 
but how do we not have something for Earth Day or Arbor Day? But so we at least have to plant a tree, one tree. So it was, I, I organized this um, in my first real, like basically month, and we got it on the ground. And um, I said, you know, we're gonna we're gonna plant it for Earth Day um, or the Saturday of Earth Day, but I may or may not be able to attend because at the time I was nine months pregnant. So um, turns out I did not attend uh, because I did end up giving birth. And fun fact, my son's uh, birthday is Earth Day. Hey. Um, <laughs> I didn't plan it, I swear, it just happened. Um, another event I created was the Repair Fair and Recycling Expo. So we already had the Recycling Expo in place, which was an event for people to come and bring their hard to recycle items. So we have the, you know, the what we call convenience centers in Virginia with the plate, the drop off where they can come and bring their aluminum and their cardboard and their glass. Um, but this event was to collect hard to recycle items. So we partnered with a bunch of um, local organizations to collect donations, um, shred paper, collect batteries, all those things. That was already established, but I added the repair fair um, part of it. So on the, on the outside, we were doing the drive through collecting everything. And on the inside, people could bring items that were lightly broken to have them repaired. So we had um, somebody who did wooden furniture, computers, sewing, um, jewelry, and so on. And so that was a really cool thing. It, it ended up being incredibly um, hard to put together. It was a lot of planning, but it was wildly successful. Um, every time we posted something about it on Facebook, it got a ton of interaction and it was really like positive for the community. Um, and then we also had our litter cleanups. So the county already had their annual litter cleanup in the springtime, but then I added the Great American Cleanup and Clean the Bay Day, which are both Great American Cleanup is with Keep America Beautiful and Clean the Bay Day is with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation in, in Virginia. It's like a, a whole, the whole state of Virginia participates. Can you go to the next slide. And then I also implemented some other programs. Um, the first one is the Litter League. So um, we had a lot of litter supplies on hand, buckets, grabbers, gloves, all this. Um, and I constantly had people reach out and say, hey, we want to do a litter cleanup. You know, we're the Girl Scouts or we're this organization. And um, I would have to organize getting them their litter supplies and when and where and how many. And it was incredibly tedious and um, didn't make any sense to me. So I came up with the idea of having the library I made kits for the library of, in kits of four, and then whoever wanted to do just a one-off cleanup, they could just go to the library and check it out just as they would any other book, or as you know, most libraries now, they have these programs to check out other things other than books. So that took um, a lot off my plate, and also it made, it, um, made them responsible for returning it, because a lot of times when we were giving the people the supplies, they weren't giving them back. Um, and then we had our local Adopt-a-Spot program through Keep America Beautiful. Um, and then we had the Clean Business Awards, which is that second picture there. Every quarter we would find a local business that was doing sustainable practices and we would give them an award and write about them on the website and social media. Um, we also had the Good Neighbor Grant, which we gave to HOA organizations and community organizations to do any environmental um, projects. So it was really, and prior to me, it was kind of very traditional. And I tried to encourage them to you know, think outside the box. So we had people you know, building tranquility gardens and doing stormwater improvements. You know, I tried to get those biodigesters out there. It didn't happen, but maybe one day. Um, and then another thing I did was I implemented a quarterly newsletter because we were doing all this stuff and we, you know, we were posting about on Facebook, but um, I wanted to have like a streamlined thing that we could put out every three months. And um, it was within the two years that I had it, we had almost a thousand subscribers and we had like a really high, I can't remember what our open rate was, but it was like incredibly high for a newsletter. And then um, we did have some recycling programs as well. One that I didn't establish, but it was really cool that I promoted heavily was the oyster shell um, program and that's also with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation that we had at each of our convenience centers corrals for restaurants or residents to go drop off their oyster shells and then the Chesapeake Bay Foundation would collect them, put um, oyster 
clean the oysters on them and then put them back out into the Chesapeake Bay, which is like one of the most important um, like ecologically biodiverse places on the planet. And then probably one of my, or probably definitely is, my most successful um, program to date was our glass only recycling program. So as you may or may not know, recycling glass is um, not ideal. And you know, in commingled recycling, you put everything in the bin and then it has to go to a MRF or a materials recovery facility. And when it goes to the MRF, it goes through all these different systems to pull out the different commodities. Um, and you know, you've got the magnets that pull out the ferrous metals, and then the eddy current gets the aluminum, and then you know things go through, and the the optical sorters get the plastic. Um, and the way the glass gets sorted is basically it's what's left at the end by the weight. And so if you were to look at a pile of glass that comes out of the MRF, you would not recognize it as glass. It's just a bunch of little pieces of plastic and paper and glass. If you step on it, you hear the crunch, but it does not look like glass. So basically a glass manufacturing company is not able to purchase that, put it in their kilns and produce glass bottles. So what happens, um, particularly in the state of Virginia, is they use that as alternate daily cover in landfills. So what that means is um, landfills are federally required to put down a substance every day to kind of keep everything compact down into the earth. And um, so a lot of them use this MRF glass. And technically, the Virginia Department of Qual um, Environmental Quality counts that as recycling, which I don't really understand because if it's being put down in the landfill forever, we're not really recycling it. Um, but coincidentally, James City County has a world class glass manufacturer inside of it. It's called um, OI Glass, formerly Owens, Illinois. So we came up with the idea that, hey, we have this glass manufacturer right here. We know we have a bunch of glass. Why can't we just take the glass and bring it directly to them? And that's what we did. So we established separate glass bins. So when people would drive to the convenience center, instead of putting it with the paper and the um, plastic, they would put it in a special purple bin. And we also had curbside recycling, but we did encourage people to keep their glass separate. We did not mandate it, um, but we basically just did this huge outreach campaign about this program. And we were able to convince people so thoroughly that they shouldn't put their glass in their co-mingled that at one point our roll-off truck was shut down and we couldn't go empty the glass, the purple bins. And so for like a couple of weeks, we couldn't accept any glass. And I was getting phone calls left and right. I'm not putting my glass in my in my curbside bin because I know it doesn't really get recycled. So we know that we, we really accomplished our mission. Um, but the best part of the program was that as for a thank you for OI, they gave a charitable donation to the United Way of the Virginia Peninsula, and we made sure that those funds went directly into James City County facilities. So it was kind of, in my mind, like the perfect sustainable example, right? Because you have the economic component that it's a local business that you're you're helping. It has the environmental component because you're actually recycling the glass, and then it has the social component because you're helping the people. Um, and then another program that I implemented was the Trex Soft Plastic. I'm sure you may know when you go to Publix or Walmart and you drop your plastic off in the bin, that all gets shipped to a company called Trex. And if you're a community and you, you collect 500 pounds worth in six months, then you get a bench. So we were able to get benches every six months. That's our pollinator garden. We put it out um, and we put some at bus stops that didn't have benches. So that was another great program. Okay, so now I am at the city of Clearwater. So as you know, I'm from here, right? And so I was in Virginia and I was like keeping an eye on Indeed because you know, you never know what's gonna pop up. And I see the city of Clearwater sustainability division manager. And I'm like, wow, that like is perfect. Um, so I applied and I got the job and I came back. So um, population is a little bit bigger. Um, and the best part is that we're a team of two. So it's not just me. I also have a sustainability specialist who you may know, um, Melody Yin, she was a student here as well. So that's really great. Um, the next slide. And what's really great is we actually have a sustainability action plan. So in Virginia, I did not have one. I wrote one. Um, it was in a final draft stage right as I was leaving, but I'm not sure what's going to happen with it. Um, 
doubtful that it would happen anything soon. So what's really great is I've had this plan already that has all these goals. It's adopted by the city. So I actually have these things that I can say this is what we're going to do. Um, and it has these eight subcategories um, and the main the overarching goal of the plan is to reduce the city's greenhouse gas emissions uh, with some certain targets. Next slide. So the first thing I did was get that newsletter started because I know how important that is. So we've got that. We've just uh, put out the first issue in October and um, when I say the last newsletter had a positive reaction, in this newsletter, I came into several emails, one by one of our city council members who's running for mayor, that was like the best email I've ever received in my life. She was so excited about it. Um, the city manager, everybody was like really impressed. So um, that's uh, something that I'm really looking forward to. We might have to bump it up more than quarterly because we have a lot going on. Go to the next slide. So one of the things that Melody had in the works when I came was she had applied for this uh, stormwater outreach and education grant and um, we just wrapped it up so you can see these signs we've posted in six parks throughout Clearwater there's different signs um, we have these stickers here and there was some like folding little pamphlets that she produced and then on the right we went out to one of the parks and we did like a educational day with it was at a dog park um, encouraging people to, you know, pick up their pet waste and how that affects stormwater quality. So we're currently going through our sustainability action plan, me and Melody and my director, and we're kind of seeing what the status is and all these goals that are laid out. And one of the goals says that every year we're going to have an annual compost bin giveaway day. And I think we did it once like four years ago. So I'm like, let's do it. So I said, we're doing it. And I called, you know, my friend Savannah, who, by the way, is also a Patel College graduate. <laughs> she's my outreach coordinator in the solid waste department. So, you know, she's my buddy. And I called her and I said, well, let's do this compost bin giveaway day. And she was like, oh, OK, let me talk to my director. And then I, you know, I wrote everything up and then they said, well, who's going to pay for it? And I said, you guys are. <laughs> and they didn't like that, but I convinced them. And so we're doing it. We're giving out 150 compost bins. But there's a, a course that my predecessor um, created that's on our website and they have to take the course and it's quite a lot. I took it. It, took, it takes a couple hours, so they have to actually work for it and then they get this free compost bin. So Savannah, uh, Savannah and I will be out passing those out next weekend. Go ahead. And then one of the other things that it says in our green print is that we will also <laughs> have an annual test drive event for the public. And we just installed six new EV chargers at our Coachman Park, which is our newly renovated $90 million park. Um, and so we wanted to have a bit of a ribbon cutting ceremony. And I said, hey, let's turn this ribbon cutting ceremony into that public EV test drive. And now we're coming back to because guess who our local representative for the uh, Southeast Clean Energy Alliance is Dory Larson. So that you know who I worked with and turned the tide for tarp in, I get an email from her and I'm like, Dory, it's me, which I have a new last name now, so I don't think she recognized me. Um, but so we're going to be hosting this event December 1st. Um, so this is one of our many transportation goals. Um, and I am currently right now drafting a regional electric mobility roadmap grant with the Department of Energy for $500,000. So we're that's a secret though, so don't tap it. OK, and then something else that's been ongoing for a while, but we're wrapping up right now. Um, some of you may know the state of Florida uh, resilient Florida grant program is basically forcing everybody to do these um, resiliency studies, which is great because otherwise I don't know that they would. Um, so we're wrapping ours up and we will get this beautiful resiliency report where we're going to have um, all these projections from the worst case scenario of a digital twin. Um, based on flood, heat, and other things. So this, we're, we're right now, the Technical Advisory Committee is reviewing all of the information. Um, we had a meeting today or yesterday, and it's really like, it's beyond my level of technical understanding, but it's great. Is that it? Oh, right, and uh, one more project we have going on um, is our Municipal Energy Savings Program. So this is something um, that started last year um, but the city 
hired a consultant called Synergistic, and we have our own energy specialist. It's his full-time job is to work for the city of Clearwater and to go around and to um, basically do what I did in Virginia, which I, but I couldn't really do at much of a capacity, but he has to create these behavioral changes, changing the set points, um, analyzing the bills and seeing why things are, you know, why are, why is this, he's doing water as well. So, you know, we were seeing this one, um, um, where the water comes out, I can't remember the name, meter, um, uh, like 500,000 gallons came out of it in one month. And, you know, we're like, we can't, and we actually still can't figure it out. Um, but he's doing that. And so far, we've reduced the electricity consumption by 9%, natural gas by 27% which has saved um, the city $450,000. So that's awesome. And that's it. It's winning. Do you know what software is being used? What skills they're bringing to bear on this? Is this something you're using? Unreal Engine, Unity, um, kind of the gamification? software is this a consultant that's doing it yeah the consultant that's doing it um they're like they're showing it to us but i don't know that they've actually mentioned the name of the software but i can find out i'm sure that would be good to see i mean they could be using arcgis's um what is it called where's okay. andrew usually you'll yeah andrew went um arcgis does have a city builder 3d component I haven't found it to be really useful and I just wonder what direction to point our students because these kind of jobs are out there. Obviously, you're hiring people to do it. It'd be nice if we knew here what sort of software and skill set to point our students towards today because I think digital twinning is now a huge industry. Yeah. You're able to simulate alternate futures. So if you could let us know, that would be very helpful yeah. because we have a new course that we were just at Innovative Ed before we came over here shooting some modules for next semester. It's called Sustainability Design Laboratory. So it's supposed to prepare students here with those particular skills for things like digital twinning. I got a host of questions, so if you don't start. <laughs> off, I just have one question because I heard about this energy certificate you mentioned. Do you like actually have to like experience the working or can you also apply as a student? Because like I have an engineering background and I looked it up and it says like I think three years of yeah. an engineering background and I also worked for a year. So yeah, it depends. Like there's a matrix and it depends yeah. on what your education is in and what your career experience is in. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any way to get it without a certain level of experience though. Mm -hmm. Like I think for me, I was going to have to have because my bachelor's wasn't related and I don't think I'm not sure how it worked, but I think I was going to have to have like three years as an energy manager before I could take like the real test. Oh, uh, OK. Makes sense. OK. But I mean, it's incredibly like I tried explaining to my previous director that it is not sustainability. I mean, energy efficiency is a whole different game. You're talking HVAC, plumbing. It's very technical. I said I can learn this, but like this would this is like a bachelor's degree. This is something that I know nothing about. Like I have a hard science background, but I don't know what any of this like this is not my area. Yeah. When we learned about energy, we learned about like renewable energy. So it's very different, which is why I kept trying to explain being an energy manager is not really sustainability, at least in my realm. Yeah, okay. In engineering. Yeah. I don't know if you mentioned it. What was your degree for your bachelor's at UF? Anthropology and classical history. Oh, okay. I was a geology undergrad at UF, so I was just wondering how you like came to sustainability here. But. Yeah. Um, I just always was really passionate about the environment yeah. and, um, you know, to get a degree in anthropology or classical history, you have to get your PhD and I wasn't going to do that. So <laughs> yeah, I started looking at other ideas and came upon this University of South Florida Global Sustainability back in 2017. I didn't even know what that meant, but I read the description, said that sounds really cool. Here we are, and now it's like the second grow, second largest growing industry in the United States or the world. You guys are lucky because there was no jobs five years ago. <laughs> you mentioned that you found the Clearwater job by looking at a website called what? Indeed. 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 <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, come on. 
You've yeah. never heard of a dean? I don't look for jobs. Yeah, I it's funny. <laughs> I have no problem. I would threaten the dean and the faculty if I started looking at a dean indeed. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. Like really? LinkedIn. How long is it? LinkedIn is, right? I do know it. Similar. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I also know it's Facebook. Is. I'm old. <laughs> that you know. really old. You have mastered that one. I have mastered that one. Really, indeed, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what? It might have been LinkedIn. I don't remember where I found the job. And what did you did you were you searching actively? I mean, do we recommend students put in the search box? Yeah, I think I just like or? permanently had it on sustain. I had like because you can save your searches. <laughs> so I think I had like sustainability. The United States and then like sustainability Tampa and like sustainability Virginia maybe and so emails. Yeah, I'm on yeah, email page like every week. New jobs for whatever you pick area. Internationally or just last? You can, what you're, they have some international, yeah. yeah. You can do location and a like concentration for a job if you want. Interesting. You know, not now that my wife wants to get out of the United States. Because if 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 the anti environmental forces win in 2024, climate change is considered a hoax again, and it becomes difficult to run a climate concentration. She says, "Where are we going to go?" I just worry about sending my child to school because I don't want him to get shot. Right. Yeah, she's worried about that too. Country. <coughs> oh, and there's there's the anti Semitic violence on both both so called sides of the equation. Whether you're Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, doesn't matter. There's this war is creating crazies that are doing crazy stuff. Yeah. Any other questions related to this? How did you phrase to the solid waste department about getting them to pay for the compost bins? It's so basically our sustainability action plan, which I did bring a copy of, um, has like a million things that we're supposed to do and I cannot do all of these things so um, we basically said that the sustainability division would do the pilot projects of these things but then it has to be passed over because how could I be running 800 programs at once I can't I need to just you know set them into place or help set them in place and then they'd be taken over I mean compost is solid waste it makes sense and because um, they get, you know, the pushback was, well, you guys paid for them last time. Said, well, that was the pilot project. And now, here you go. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Cassidy. Yeah. Uh, there's another question from the chat. It's from Dr. Filipides. He mm -hmm. says, uh, does your team in Clearwater partner with sustainability teams in other municipalities? Oh, yes. And if so, what kind of joint activities, if any? So, and I should have mentioned that um, for both Virginia and here, we have great regional partnership um, with our fellow localities. So in Virginia, we had an, a, a monthly meeting and then here as well, and we have a Pinellas Sustainability and Resilience Network, and we meet monthly. So like half of the people in there are in Patel. So we've got Ashley and Oldsmar, um, and, um, some of Tarpons in there um, and St. Pete, which is also um, from here. So it, like when I, my first meeting, I was like, oh, I know half these people. <laughs> but yeah, it's a really great network. And it's funny because I'm currently working on this, um, this grant and I've reached out to the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Courtney is also a graduate and um, she was um, she was mentioning, oh, we should have like a Tampa Bay resiliency network. And I was like, oh, we have one, but it's just for Pinellas. <laughs> so perhaps now I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think maybe we do need to get one a little bit broader and get Hillsborough and maybe Pasco or um, even Sarasota involved because, you know, Sarasota, we've got Aaliyah as well. Yeah, we're there. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question from Dr. Vandy. Is the Clearwater vulnerability assessment mainly focused on sea level rise? Um, no, that's one of the components, but heat is another component as well as flooding from storms, increased storm frequency, um, sea canopy coverage, um, and how that affects like the, the urban heat island effect. There is a lot of components to it. Um, sea level rise. 
curious about the oyster program again a visit of a student another one of tell graduates who's working with the zoo out on the cape canaveral it's called cape kennedy at their zoo they're doing a lot of oyster shell restoration gathering them is the science that because the fry or whatever you call the the small the spat the spat in the wild would inhabit the old shells of a parent stock that if you put these back in the water they'll migrate to it and if so how do you then determine the density of the oyster shells so that it replicates conditions that they would have evolved for because it seems if you just dump them in the water you're not necessarily creating those conditions so um, I didn't implement that program and it was through the Chesapeake Bay Foundation but I did do quite a bit of research about it and I talked to them and they said that you know the Chesapeake Bay they oysters are really important and they did all this research trying to figure out how to colonize oysters and they used um, you know cement blocks they used tires they tried using all these different things to get the baby oysters to grow they said you know, after trying out I don't know how many different surfaces they realized that what works really well is oyster shells and so but they would collect them and they would bring them out to their lab and they would clean them and then they would put the spat on them in the lab uh -huh. and then when they were a certain level of growth then they would put them back out into oh, the bay okay. now I understand. but it's interesting because we did a living shoreline field trip psrn and um i forget which organization it was but they're working on this same project this oyster collection and um and putting them back out into the sea and i was telling them like oh you should reach out to the chesapeake bay foundation because they've been working on this for years so again like just these connections that keep happening and why do you think the biodigesters haven't been anchoring i mean you worked on the one at fatby farm you have direct experience there's commercial models at many scales now we have a student, Jenny Jagel, who came back to present, as you know, and she's working for a Danish yeah, company that's building the one here in Tampa. Yeah. What was going on up in Virginia and what's happening here that makes that such a hard sell? Well, in Virginia, I talked about it a lot. And my, you know, they were on board. They wanted like a pilot project and we were gonna do one. We were gonna like put it out at the rec center. But obviously I had like a million things going on and you have to time it right in Virginia because you can't do it going into the winter. So I just didn't have enough time to get it done, but it was it was supported. Like I actually gave a presentation. We had our weekly like director meeting and I gave it to there and the Parks and Rec director called me. He was like, I want one. So I was I probably would have done it eventually, but I've also talked about it with my director here and we have these um, huge cement cylinders um, that they were for underground trash cans and they, the technology, I guess, didn't work out too well. And so now we just have these huge, they're not cylinders actually, they're rectangles, um, with, with, but they don't have a top. And he was asking me if we could build biodigesters out of them. I said, yes, and I emailed you. You didn't oh, respond. Right, that was that email. <laughs> but didn't I eventually respond and say, no? No. <laughs> but you were connecting me to the other person? I was connecting you. I was just saying, let's, can we make these a biodigesters? Yeah, I know. Let's do it. Personally, do it. Um, and with Sylvia Earl getting the Lifetime Achievement Award the other night and coming to campus, and with Jenny's project and others, we were talking with her group in Dunedin about reviving the idea of getting Ashley's uh, mm -hmm. capstone work to have oh, the wow. first saltwater biodigesters. Yeah. And I think that's the thing to do that would be different than what Jenny's doing and what others are doing. Because if you can establish at a larger scale and useful, not these IBC tanks that we did with Ashley, but useful large digester for salt water. Let's do it in clear water. Yeah, it has to be on the ocean where you have access to salt water and they inoculate. But if we could do that, that would be worth the time. Just for you to know, we proved with uh, one of our students, Ashley Painter, out at the Apollo Beach facility for education, something that had been in the literature told could not be done, which is having saltwater based digesters. And the idea came out of a trip with students to Key West when the municipality said that they have a problem with bilge water from sailboats and in, in the marinas, people are pooping in salt water basically, and then it's creating horrible hypoxic conditions when it's discharged into the oceans. So for coastal communities, 
your marinas are terrible places because fecal material and salt water don't degrade properly. It just causes contamination. So we did some research in Key West and they determined you could not do biodigestion in salt water. And we looked in the literature and there was no evidence. And then we were talking about it in class and Ashley said, why don't we just try and see? Because she worked at Moat Marine and said, what if we use dolphin poop and manatee poop and fish poop as the inoculant since they evolved in salt water? And of course it works. And so she proved brackish and salt and it hasn't gone much further than a few presentations we did. So if you're looking for something, this would be a great connection for a capstone to do the first larger scale salt water digesters. They don't exist anywhere in the world. They could be used for red tide for all the kill that's now buried. What you do in clear water, you just take tractors and all the bodies and it's, it's a mess after red tide kill. And yet it could be turned into a source of fertility for seagrass, for example, and for energy. Show up when you have weird projects. You can do them. <laughs> and I work with Ashley on all sorts of things. The question about um, <clears throat> your time in Virginia did a lot of outreach and a lot of different events <coughs> and things like this. That gets me excited because mm -hmm. I'm very much so like a people person and I have no problem being out. What skills did you use during that time that could perhaps make someone competitive for being interested in that role? Well, I was a bartender for about 10 years, so yeah. I think I'm just talking to people. <laughs> talking to people. Yeah, I love outreach. Um, I think it's really important, and I, if I could just do outreach, I would. But, you know, when you want to climb the, the sustainability ladder, you got to do these more important things like vulnerability assessments and greenhouse gas inventories. But I love going out to the library and setting up a table and talking to people about class only recycling and all these programs. And I think, you know, I've, I did this like one week course on behavioral change. And basically it said the only way to change behavior is to like talk to people. You can put up a million signs. You can you know put all these social media posts. You can make videos. But until you actually talk to somebody one on one, you're not really going to have any impact. About one to many, your presentation uh, roster. I mean, you're here today. Do you do? Public speaking. Do. How do you prepare for that? I pretty much say yes to most things when people ask me. <coughs> so when people say, you know, I had like a go to, I had several go to presentations in Virginia already ready to go. So the school reached out. I said, yep. And I would, you know, go in and edit it for a little bit. For, but for the most part, I would say, do you want to, do you want one about recycling, um, sustainable landscaping, the programs we have here in Virginia? or energy efficiency. Nine times out of 10, they picked recycling, boring, but that's what it was. I, I preferred when they picked anything else. So would you encourage students at Patel who may be watching who are in this room? Oh yes, you should definitely start presenting on a weekly basis in your class. <laughs> I remember my first week, <laughs> we had a syllabus and it said like we had to write this paper. And so I wrote the paper. But then it comes out, you don't actually have to write the papers and teach this class. But I had already written it, so he made me get up and present my entire paper and talk about like why I wrote all these things. And you know, that was bizarre. But then I learned that you could do the more fun things and create the videos. And I'm not like a technologically savvy person at all, but I did all sorts of I used Blender and made, you know, a 3D model of a biodigester, and I like animated one of one of the professors, I think it was Rothrock's video, um, did all sorts of fun stuff. So I encourage doing all that. And then, and then having them available, as you said, in your blog and in other asset areas. So yeah, that's where I got all these pictures today. I was like, oh, I'm going to go back to my blog and pull all those pictures because otherwise I probably wouldn't have them. I mean, I got some of them from Facebook, but most of them were from my blog. So use your time to create presentations that you'll have off the shelf ready to go for whatever comes up. Let me open it up to our <laughs> online guests. Does anyone have any other questions? Can you flip back through your slides as they're thinking? Because there were some that I wanted to comment on as well. When you see them, it jogs you.
Oh, has there been any traction on the idea that we were proving up at Rosebud that you can compost better by grinding your food? And uh, just encourage in the course to make it as small as pieces as possible. Any, any talk about using common food grinder garbage disposals to? I don't remember if the course mentions using the incinerator. I don't think it does, but. That would be a good meme to carry from our program into this, this level. We're talking with the Florida Wildlife Corridor now about making sure that where people camp or where there's a possible conflict with bear and other wildlife, that there are grinders put in because we've determined that if you grind up the food, you can broadcast or to leave it sitting there and it has no interest to wildlife. We want to prove that. It certainly works. Those other things that would be nice to get people. And anything about the glass, uh, we now have that glass <coughs> crusher up at Rosebud. Yeah. We're getting, Anything in that going on for Well, I, I saw your glass crusher, um, and I was I, I actually did look in to see if there was any local glass manufacturer to see if we could replicate this. And there is one, I think, in Sarasota um, that produces glass bottles. But the thing about glass is it's so heavy that it costs so much to transport it that I don't know that it would be economically viable driving all the way to Sarasota, even though that's not that far. Well, what but, we what we did, but if you crushed it, it would probably be well. Yeah, and I was saying better, instead of bringing it to be remanufactured, what the guy who sold us the machine up about an hour north of here, we had several PCGS students who were with us when we made the purchase. Kalen Lawson was one of them. Um, is to use it for beach restoration, which is what they do in New Zealand and Australia. So you crush the glass, and then it's a sifter to take out the paper and the plastic from the labels, and then you just. What they do in Northern Virginia, which is what we based our program off of, the whole purple bin program, is they they crush it and they put it in the roads. Yeah, yeah. For example, yeah, their aggregate. And then treks, you see it down in the Everglades, all over the trails where you look for manatees and alligators. Yeah, do we not day. have a treks program here like this? We should. I'm pretty sure it's nationwide. I'm pretty sure everything you take to public goes to treks. It's just that a community organization, which can be a school, a local government, uh, the Alliance Club, Girl Scouts, the community organization can sign up for the Trex Challenge and they have to collect 500 pounds. It's all an honor base system. So you get an account and you say, OK, we brought 60 pounds to Winn-Dixie. We brought 100 pounds to Publix and you just say where you brought it. And then if you meet the 500 pounds in six months, which is actually a lot of plastic, 500 pounds of plastic bags is a lot, yeah. um, then you get a bench. And it has to be LDPE plastic bags, can't be HDPE. It has to be anything that is stretchy, stretchy. not crinkly. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, so it has to be LDPE. It's good to know. Clean and dry. 500 pounds. Oh yeah, and that will, magazine they they asked me <coughs> back up um i got a call from the local um other way magazine that said oh we're doing this issue on science and, su and sustainability is a science we wanted to know if we could interview I said yeah of course and then we did the interview and they said okay we're going to send out the photographer blah, blah blah i said oh there's going to be a picture okay i didn't expect that i thought i'd just send my like standard headshot and then, uh, like a couple weeks later, they're like, oh, by the way, you're going to be in the front cover. And I was like, <laughs> it goes out to 40,000 households. <laughs> you know how many copies I got sent to my office? Everybody, I got phone calls. I literally <laughs> was kind of a celebrity because I would be out and about. And people were like, aren't you on that magazine cover? Uh, I was like, <laughs> like friends were like, did I see you on the good neighbors? I was like, yep. Yeah, you see. <laughs> What was that size slide right there? That was the thing at the university. So it's changed now. It's not called the Summer Institute on Sustainability and Energy. It's called something else very similar. Um, but I know a lot of Patel students did it at least the year with my year and the year before. I remember you went to Chicago. Um, but I don't know if it's how active it still is. Did they cover your expenses? It was totally free. Even to get out to Chicago? They, I think they reimbursed up to a certain amount. But you know me, I was flying from like Belize or something, so they didn't. <laughs> I remember when you were talking about that was a fun program. Yeah. Dr. Philippides says yes, it, the 
we've sent several students out, so it's still. Oh yeah, so he's energy, so he probably knows it. There's Jerry. Yeah. Hello, Jerry. Have you been uh, out since? Do you know what what's the fate of? I haven't, and I want. I went on their website, and they do all these tours, but a you have to pay for them, and b it's like a minimum, you know, like fifteen yeah. people or something. So I don't know if I can just reach out and say, can I just come look? <laughs> or can I organize? I might actually try and get PSRN to like do an actual tour. Because we were looking, we're, we were having this workshop and we were looking for a, a local place. And I was like, we should go to Fappy. But technically it's in Hillsboro, so. Our next scheduled biodigester build is supposed to be with Suncoast composting, Nick Ewing, who Sarah Long is working with in the artist space that she talked about, that she sang about. I didn't, re I didn't realize I recognized Sarah Long. And then I was looking back at my blog, and there she was doing the solar hot water system in the pictures. I'm like, yeah. oh, I guess I did know her. I don't know how I forgot her because she's very memorable. Yeah. But she was in the pictures. That's good to document. <laughs> our veins through that. And that's our famous photo <laughs> on the bottom that we recreated and um, has now been shared all the platforms. Uh, but the biodigester at FAPI is doing well and they, uh, Josie has created like this Excel catalog of all the different things from the kitchen that goes into the incinerator and then into the biodigester. And so she's collecting excellent data on like. Cool. I really wanna, people ask me about it when I talk about it and I'm like, I have no idea what's going on with it. So they're definitely taking ownership of it, and they have the slurry integrated into their fertigation system. So it's their irrigation, but now it's fertigation because it's a fertilizer, and they they mix it like ten to one, something like that. Still out of that big IVC tank on the truck with the sprayer. Oh, they do that when they have excess slurry, but they still do do that. Um, but they they have been having issues with getting the grill to work and using the methane to get the grill lit. But they definitely use it yeah, we just daily for the fertigation. Do they not know how to modify the grill like we did on Saturday at the uh, Rosebud when we just took out the restriction nozzles? Because it could be a simple technical thing. Use something like that. Or is the gas too carbon dioxide rich? Is it flaming right? I mean, I'm not sure. I've never seen it lit. They just said that they have issues with it and they're still problem solving it. Hmm. Unfortunately, I bought a condo, which I'm really sad because that means they don't have outdoor space. But I do have a little screened in patio, so I'm going to get worms, which I've had before. But I already bought them. I got to set them up. Uh, now that you're reminding me, I should, because people that do the worms, because it's very small, they say it doesn't, it's not fast enough for all their food waste. But I bet you if I That's what I did in shred, shred it, then I could. Find it and it doesn't matter what you put in them because you balance the pH and you yeah. hydrolyze it through the breakdown of the cell walls. And, Worms will eat anything, so forget this whole thing about. Can I like citrus. manipulate my? I there is an. In, I already have a incinerator. Can I just like? Yeah, just turn it around. It take yeah. it. Take the pipe out. Turn it around. I did it at Greenberg Hebrew Center in New York. They had uh, space for it, and I put it in, and I put a T valve, so they could either go to sewer septic, or go to a bucket, and that gave the option. Mm -hmm. Just put a T in and out. So there's, okay, I want it to go to the septic or the sewer, or I want to use it. My brother. Yeah. <laughs> That's the best the best way to do it or or have it just go to a bucket. So you're saying that if you grind up things like citrus and like pineapple, yeah, all the stuff that the worms don't like because you're mixing the food waste and you're grinding it, you get hydro hydrolysis, mm -hmm. you get aeration so it oxidizes mm -hmm. so you're unlikely to have a pH go swing either to alkaline or acid mm -hmm. so it stays neutral. And that eliminates odor, doesn't attract so called vermin or wildlife conflict bears and all that. Mm -hmm. And it's pre digested so the worms can get at it. And so mm -hmm. even if you just broadcast it on top of the worm bin, they will determine how high up they go to get at it. So you don't have to even mix it in. You just spread it over this, don't drown them. Mm -hmm. So you might want to dewater a little bit. Sometimes we pour it in a bucket with holes at the bottom just to get out the excess water. Yeah, this is like a layered system and yeah. it has a. Drain. Drain that collects. So you can just pour that in and then it forms soil really quickly, even without the worms. It's three to six days to form soil as opposed to a composter taking months, but the worms will accelerate it even faster and produce worm castings that are extra valuable.
Oh, the food grinder is like the step one. It's the jaws and the teeth that evolution didn't provide some organisms. And when evolution created jaws and teeth, we know that uh, you know the metazoan evolution microorganisms now able to really rapidly assimilate nutrients. So if we don't put mechanical teeth and jaws into an ecology system, you're just waiting for the fungi. And it ain't now. So you got to put some mechanical and the energy input is so low, such a fraction of what the yield is. It's worth putting a grinder at the front end of everything. That I get underneath my sink now. <laughs> well, I was originally going to buy one of the countertop composts that like does that. I actually bought it and then Melody was like, those are not emission friendly, like they use more energy than the yeah. whatever. So I returned it. And then it's I got between a half a kilo, was. half a kilowatt to a kilowatt hour per grind for a small quantity. And it, it three hours. We have two of them at Rosebud. What it does is it desiccates as it grinds, and you end up with a powder that nothing wants. So you have to rehydrate it if you want worms or organisms to make use of it because they can't use the dried stuff. So it's used for like if you lived in an apartment in New York on the 70th floor. Yeah, maybe. But we'd rather use 60 watts rather than a kilowatt. Get 10 times, 20 times as much ground up. It's wet, so it's already ready to compost. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming all the way out here for us. More in the last. That I, have. I owe you an answer to an email about I'm going to reply it to it so you can see and you and everybody else know that the best way to reach me is publicly through our Facebook groups or perusal or some Should I just put it on solar cities on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, because then if I and you'll be accountable. For yeah, I am. And then other people are like triangulating and saying,